David Vinkler, Associate State Director of AARP in Illinois. Thanks for joining us on the Illinois Channel. Thank you. We wanted to talk, uh, as, as we were talking off camera, and everyone who covers the legislature knows, the two primary issues this spring session is addressing the pensions and the other is Medicaid. And both of those are uh, policy pro or programs with some runaway costs that both the governor and the state legislature is trying to get under control. And therein is the controversy, whichever proposals are being made as far as how do we bring those programs uh, and, and control their costs. So we wanted to focus with you on Medicaid. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us first of all, just before we go into the issue of Medicaid, just give us a little synopsis of what it is you do for AARP and, and your, your background so that you're uh, knowledgeable on the topic. Okay. Uh, what I do is I do a lot of our lobbying work. Uh, we. AARP uses volunteers to do most of our on-ground lobbying with legislators. So a good portion of my job is coordinating those volunteers as well as giving them a lot of background on what's going on, what are the issues we have to push, and you know, in a year like this where we're looking at dozens of Medicaid cuts, where are the areas that we really have to focus on to send our message out there? Um, How long I, have you studied uh, the Medicaid issue? Uh, working with AARP, I worked with the Department on Aging and worked on Medicaid waiver programs there. And before that, I worked uh, at the Bureau of the Budget um, for the state. So I did a lot of health care work, or I was in the health care division there. Now, when, when we talk about the Medicaid program, uh, the, the governor is proposing to cut $2.7 billion out of the program. Yes. Why is he proposing that? What's the problem? Well, there's two portions of the problem, and I think a lot of times we look at this as just the cost growth, or the programs growing out of control, um, and that's only partly true. Uh, there are There is program growth, and certainly uh, working with AARP, we're aware that the population of seniors is growing, um, and there's no way you're going to slow that portion down. So as people you know, need services and... Um, are getting towards that need for Medicaid, whether in long-term care costs are extraordinarily high, um, you're going to see some growth there. Uh, but there's also a good because portion. the pop. I mean, just to, yeah. because the population of recipients is going up. Yes. Now we should under uh, we should also start because people get confused between Medicare and Medicaid. Yes. And when we talk about Medicaid, we're talking about health care for the poor. Right. And. And if you're talking with seniors, right, because seniors are covered by Medicare, um, if we're talking about long-term care needs, whether they're in a community or in the nursing home, Medicare doesn't cover a lot of those costs. So the state picks up those costs in Medicaid. So while seniors a lot of times aren't taking a bigger part of the acute care side of Medicaid, they are, talking, they are taking up a big portion of the chronic care side, which are nursing home and the cost of or the cost of sustaining somebody in the community. And those people, there may be any thousands of middle class Illinoisans who may look at Medicaid as something that is being cost driven by uh, poor people in urban areas perhaps. Right. When in fact, that while that may be true and is true, yeah. the other aspect is looking in the years ahead, they may have to deplete all of their life savings right. for long-term care in a nursing home and then themselves go on Medicaid. Yeah, and I mean, I guess a good way to try and imagine that is um, a lot of us don't think about long-term care before we actually need it or before a loved one needs it. Uh, when you're looking at privately paying for a nursing home, uh, you, seniors are generally on a fixed income and something lower than what they were making when they were working. And if you have to start picking up a cost, certainly if I had to start picking up a cost of roughly $5,000 a month in private pay nursing home, I'd, I'd be on Medicaid eventually. Um, and when we start talking about people that are, you know, somewhere above the poverty line but not, you know, exactly rolling in cash, those people are going to be more quickly moving towards that Medicaid co or level uh, if they are needing those long-term care. So in a nutshell... Part of the problem is, and, and it's going to get worse, uh, baby boomers are going to be aging and, and we're going to have this huge demographic wave of people who are going to be needing Medicaid uh, services that are not now using it. Yeah. And then secondarily, Second. we have other problems that exist and, and are causing the problem currently. Yeah, and part of that is 
that we haven't designed budgets that actually pay for what the state is uh, basically r racking up in services every year. So they've allowed a lot of bills to flow from one year to the next, specifically within uh, the community care program, which uh, takes pe keeps people out of nursing homes um, at a much lower cost to the state. That program is carrying over well in excess of $100 million. Um, and what we see in the budget this year is a proposed total budget of $600 million. So I guess... For that one aspect. For that one program. And we should note that when we say Medicaid, it's not just one light. I mean, it's underneath that name, it's there sick. are how many different program parts? Oh. <laughs> many. <laughs> huh? Of all of Medicaid, I, I couldn't tell you exactly how many lines Is it like are. 50 or...? I'm sure there's probably around 50. Uh, 60 maybe, I mean... 50 or 60 yeah. different parts. And so, it, it, uh, I'm trying to think of an apt analogy, but, uh, uh, you know, let me give you a weird analogy perhaps, but if we say college tuition, dad has to pay for college tuition, if you had 50 or 60 kids, yeah. uh, you'd be spending different amounts of money on each one of them depending upon where they went to school and what their needs were. Right. But we put that under the one title of college tuition. In this case, it's Medicaid with 50 or 60 different programs. Right. And so, now, we, you, I'm sorry, you were just saying, when you, when you talk about community care, I don't want to get people lost here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let me, let, me, let me back off. So we already covered the, the demographic wave is going to be one thing. But right now, the, the uh, Medicaid program is in problem. And, and is part of, I'm asking, is, is part of that because Governor Blagojevich expanded the Medicaid rules that he raised the income level? I, I would say that may be a contributing factor. But I think our bigger problem this year is, as I said, the, the fact that we haven't been doing budgets in ways that actually cover what we're obligated to pay based on the services we get. So I guess the way to, one analogy you could use for that is, if I'm not paying my utility bill three months in a row, I'm gonna have a larger utility bill. But that problem isn't something where I need to like turn the TV off more or you know turn the lights down, turn the air conditioning down. The problem is I haven't paid the bill, right? I mean, I could be doing, enormously efficiently on my electricity, but if I'm not paying the bill, I'm racking up a lot more debt. Let me use that same analogy. Yeah. Let me come on. So let's say the electric bill would, as an analogy again, <laughs> let's say the electric bill uh, would normally be $70 a month. Yeah. You're saying the state, instead of budgeting $70 a month, maybe only budgets $50 a month. Yeah. So they're paying but they're not paying all of it. Yeah. And so they roll over the $20, and they roll over the $20. And so we get to the end of the year, only when we're talking about Medicaid, we're rolling over billions of dollars, right? Yeah. Yes. And, and so why are they doing that? Because they just don't want to raise the taxes, they don't want to have to come up with that much expenditures just on Medicaid, because to pay for that program, they would have to cut back too much on areas like education and other areas that they want to spend money on? Yeah, I mean, it is, it, I guess to some extent it's a, it's a question of putting your money where your mouth is. I mean, are they interested in paying for those services? I think in some cases it is um, legislatively maybe more expedient to say we're going to do this, but if we can get away with putting in a dollar figure in the budget that's somewhat lower, um, we'll try that. But unfortunately, year after year after year, that's going to start coming home to rest that we're going to need to actually pay that off. So those are some of the theoretical, I mean, not to say that they're not true, but kind right. of a approach. The other thing that many people would point out is that they often say that Medicaid uh, has a lot of fraud in it. Mm -hmm. uh, that there, in fact, we just had a story the other day of some doctors being arrested for running Medicaid scams. And um, currently, we don't do much to, not anyone can get Medicaid, supposedly. You're supposed to have below a certain income level. But they're not very good on checking income, uh, one. And they're not very good on checking whether you're even a resident of Illinois or, for that matter, a resident of the United States. Right. 
has AARP taken a position? What's your thoughts on that? And has AARP taken a position on what should be done on that? I think it's something that we were concerned about. And you have to be responsible about how you do this. I mean, in some cases, you can make policies that um, make the process so burdensome, you keep people off the service that actually need it. So we have to be careful that we don't go there. But we certainly do want to see um, a responsible system that actually looks at, are these people that are eligible for the program and deliver the services that they need? Um, so when they passed the Medicaid reform bill a couple of years ago, we were certainly with them on going forward, looking at tightening up the process. I suspect it's a little harder now um, as we continue to see you know, state staff being whittled down to some extent. Um, you know, certainly if you're going to have more oversight, you need more overseers. Uh, and I don't know that the state is, you know, comparatively speaking, um, in a better boat to do that than they were maybe a decade ago. Well, and, and the governor, as part of his own uh, effort to back progress, uh, has said that we're he's going to want to cut down on fraud and, and right. try to run a tighter ship on that. And I, I, all I'm saying is, we we're saying we have a lot of folks saying yes, we want to cut down on fraud, but then we're also wanting to cut down on the uh, infrastructure within the state to make sure that there isn't fraud. So uh, I'm not sure that sometimes you know, spending yeah <laughs> it, it, uh, oversight uh, costs money. Uh, uh, Oversight costs money, and sometimes spending pays for itself because you're going to be able to cut down on fraud. Absolutely. Uh, Julie Hamos, the director of the uh, Department of uh, Children and Family Services and uh, healthcare, <laughs> healthcare. Sorry, yeah, in family <laughs> service, um, it testified that her computers are using software that is, uh, or her computers are 30, 30 years old, 1980, right. when Ronald Reagan was elected. Uh, and she can hardly get anyone to even write the code for the program anymore. That's as somewhat of an aside. Uh, let, let's start. You're again, as we began the interview. You're with AARP. Yeah. AARP does not take a position on every issue. In fact, on the pension issue, which is the other big issue, you're you're not as an organization taking a position on that. Why are you taking a position on Medicaid and? If it were up to AARP, what would we do to make the budget work? So we're weighing in on Medicaid because there's a number of programs within the Medicaid arena that serve our, that serve AARP members. Um, specifically, what we're looking at right now, Illinois Cares RX is on the chopping block. Uh, Illinois Cares RX provides assistance with paying for pharmaceuticals for seniors. Um, there, for a couple reasons, we're there. Our, our members need these services. Uh, the health care outcomes are significantly better, um, but this political environment demands that we talk about cost, right? So Illinois Cares Rx is also a program that was developed to keep people from tapping into the emergency rooms, tapping into nursing homes. Um, when people can't pay for their drugs, they end up having to choose between food, drugs, paying the utility bills, and when they start not taking their drugs, they start showing up in emergency rooms. We also know that poor uh, control of mere meds is a leading cause of getting people into nursing homes. Um, and we know even if those folks are not Medicaid eligible right now. Which then costs the state a lot more. We your exactly. Would be. So when we look at a lot of these cuts within Medicaid. Can I emphasize that yeah. point? <laughs> You're, you would argue that if we cut back on the prescription drugs for seniors, yeah. it'll cost the state more, not save them more, because instead of paying 400 hours a month or whatever their prescription drugs may run, if they go into a nursing home, it's going to be costing 2500 to $5,000 a month. So $3,000 is roughly what the state pays. So, yeah, and it's kind of it's not different than what you were just saying about you know, it costs money to make money, or it, it costs money. Sometimes you got to spend money to save money. Exactly. Actually, it sounds oxymoronic, but it's not. If we upgraded the computer system, the state could come check on uh, if you're actually cut down on fraud. Right. In the same way, you and I, uh, if we go and swipe our card at the gas station, they know who we are within seconds. Yeah. Right. I mean, if if I can, 
they, for example, we just have an Aldi that opened up near us. Extraordinarily cheap groceries. You know, if I'm running low on money and I go, you know, I'm spending way too much money at Aldi, and then I run down the streets to the prime grocery store that's costing me twice as much, I'm not really saving money. Uh, you know, we have to make these decisions in a more circumspect way. Uh, and what we're, you know, what we're looking at here in these lists of cuts are strictly speaking, you know, if I eliminate program A, this is how much we're spending on program A. And we're not looking to that next step of if people don't get those services, where else are they going to show up? Uh, and to kind of take a step back, that's how you kind of have to look at this Medicaid system. There are certain things that the state, in order to have a Medicaid program, is mandated to do. Um, one of which is provide nursing home services. One of which is provide hospital services, and one of which is providing pharmaceutical or, uh, physicians. So these other programs that are on the chopping block right now may be easier to cut because there's no federal mandate for them, but they, by and large, a lot of these were actually designed to save the state money over these higher cost mandated services. So once you lose a lot of these programs, we may see more costs coming out of taxpayer pockets because the only venue for care for these people will be these high cost emergency rooms and nursing homes. Uh, when you go around and lobby the lawmakers, what is it that you're trying to have them do legislatively? We would really like to see them be very circumspect about this budget and really take the time to dig in, do that extra step of looking at, you know, what are the outlying costs that go along with these? Because certainly I don't think anybody, you know, regardless of their concern for the elderly or disabled, wants to end up having a budget that costs us more money because we've removed services that are saving us dollars. Medicaid is a federal program that's then run by the states and there's somewhat of a compensation. How is the federal reimbursements? Are they holding up or is the feds looking to cut back on the Medicaid compensation? Um, no, the feds aren't, as far as I know, the feds aren't looking at cutting, cutting back on compensation, but you know, one factor in all of this was for uh, a number of years we had the stimulus program that was matching at a little bit of higher rate um, than we were before. Uh, so I think it was roughly around 60 percent uh, in the past. Not I think it was last year that match rate expired. So um, where we had money coming in for the short term stimulus that disappeared. So I think while states, you know, not just Illinois, really looked at that that incentive and said we really want to control this, knowing there's an expiration date, uh, given the budget constraints for the past few years. It's been really hard to not rely on those additional dollars. When you talk about, we, the governor's proposing the cutback on the compensation rates to health care providers and nursing homes. Now, we recently interviewed Mary Jane Worth of the Illinois Hospital Association, uh, and she indicated, and others with the hospital association said, there are some hospitals, there's approximately 200 in the state of Illinois, I believe yeah. it's 205. Some of those have a much higher percentage of their income coming from Medicaid patients. Right. Uh, some hospitals in Illinois, because the state is so late in paying its bills, and I'm told that next year the state will stretch it out to nine months in arrears before they're really paying the bills, that, that some of the hospitals are already just staying open by borrowing money to meet payroll and their costs. Have you looked at or talked with people within the healthcare industry? And to what extent should we as citizens say, if they cut back on the compensation rates, uh, you're going to have healthcare providers who are just going to drop out of the system and say, I'm not going to take any more Medicaid patients. You're going to have hospitals that say, we can't afford to take any more Medicaid patients. Or you're going to have some of those hospitals whose income is so high from Medicaid patients that they might be forced to close. Right. Is that, a, let's talk about to what extent, do you, is that a concern from what you know? Yes, it is a concern. Um, and I think one of the challenges of this um, way of going about the budget where you kind of set the target 2.7 billion and say how do we meet that, um, availability is a huge issue and we're very concerned about, you know, if, if hospitals go under or other providers go under. Um, the 
the problem is there are three ways, I mean, a really simple equation that comes up with any program cost. It's the number of people you serve, the amount of service you deliver, times the rate you pay for the service. Um, so what we don't want to see is a approach that kind of takes, um, that would basically just remove one piece, hold the target, and then say, you know, all of a sudden we're not going to deal with rates, but we still have this 2.7 billion target. Um, and then what's left is all of that target cut has to come out of either people or the service they receive. Um, and it's literally foisted on just the backs of the people within the Medicaid system. So uh, we definitely think Illinois' rates are low um, for Medicaid, and a lowering of those rates is going to be certainly very problematic, and we're concerned about it. But if you hold that piece harmless and never change the target for the 2.7, uh, across $2.7 billion strictly down the back, on the backs of uh, these folks that are on Medicaid is, is, is not doable. How, to what extent have you looked at how other states are managing their system, and are they doing it better? Um, I think a lot of states are going through the same kind of struggles. Uh, I've heard that Illinois does carry over more bills um, than I think a lot of other states, and this is one of the big portions of why Illinois is kind of an outlier here. Um, so I think some states have also taken advantage of a few more of the incentives out there that came along with the Affordable Care Act. There are programs that are you know, offering higher uh, rates of reimbursement for home and community-based services that I'm, I'm not sure we've really taken the time to look at um, and go after. So I think that's one way to get it, but that may be, you know, relative to the entire problem, relatively small. As far as everyone has to make the budget work. Yeah. <laughs> so as far as making the budget work on Medicaid, if you were the governor, of course we just had a large tax increase yeah. just over a year ago, roughly 17 months ago. Would you say we have to raise taxes again? Or would you say before we do anything on the revenue side, we need to make sure the program is better administered? I think we do have to look at the program being better administered. I think when, one of the, um, the Medicaid bill was a step forward. I don't know that this is a problem that has to be solved immediately. I think we need to take a bite off right now in terms of what we're carrying over in bills. Um, as we were talking about with the electric bill analogy, mm -hmm. right? Um, if we are dealing with the structural problem in a responsible way um, in terms of our utilization of services, uh, the carryover of you know, our, uh, our bill from one year to the next is a one-time cost. You know, you pay that down and we're back to a relatively responsible level of growth. So, but you got to have the money to pay it down. You have to have the money to pay it down. So we should, and right now we don't. Right now we don't. So we need to come up with ways to take a bite out of that. You know, we don't have to pay this all right now, but take a step out of that and then move forward next, next year and keep taking these steps. And would part of those steps then be getting people off the rolls that shouldn't be there? That may be part of it, yeah. Um, I... And I think that, that that statement in and of itself requires that the state really take a harder look at these programs and strictly saying, lay out on a piece of paper, you know, 60 cuts, say how much is in these programs, and then eliminate them. There's a, I mean, that's, that's not the level of thought that we need. We need a lot more detail on this. And before we close out, and this might be an unfair thing to ask right at the end. <laughs> Have you, and I don't know, have you analyzed, you know, I don't remember what the numbers were, but famously the cost for Medicare, you know, we're talking about Medicaid, but uh, when Medicare and Medicaid were passed back in 65, I believe it was, they projected how much it would be spending in approximately the year 1995, and they were way off. Mm -hmm. The program costs were far higher. Have you ever analyzed uh, or, or know of any other approaches to the health care problem, mm -hmm. that maybe we should, in the big picture, do away with Medicaid uh, and maybe replace it with some other program? Is there, are there some other viable ideas out there? Or 
you know, to that end, are we putting band-aids on a program that is terminal, or can this actually become a program where it never has been well run before, where maybe it is well run, and we do take the steps to make sure that those who are knocking on the door and, and seeking the government's help are actually uh, people that belong in the program? Yeah, I mean, I think these programs can be run responsibly. I mean, you kind of made a reference to like Social Security, Solvency, Medicare insolvency. And um, I, again, on our going back to the analogy on the electric bill, right? We're saying, look, our utilization is out of control, but we just haven't paid the bill. Um, we're missing the problem. And I think you may be able to pinpoint some areas within Medicaid where, hey, you know, you could probably control this a little better. But at the end of the day, the biggest problem we have is we're not paying the bill. Um, so I think that's probably true of looking at, you know, some of these others. Well, but you're not paying the bill, I think, because the cost is so high and growing, right? I don't, I, it's growing. Um, it's growing. For how long have we not been paying the, the bill, do you, do you know? Well, Medicaid has had a long, long standing within the, um, like, hospitals, nursing homes. They've had a payment cycle for a long time, and this a is, delayed payment yeah, cycle. A delayed payment cycle. So we've been so, stretching the dollars out for quite some time. Right. It's been growing now. It's been growing. We're not getting caught up. We're like and, people. We're keep building up a an account balance on the credit card. Right? And the waiver program that I was talking about, the community care program, which keeps people out of nursing homes, and. 2003 was the first time I think they carried over bills. Um, and that first year they did it was like 1.5 million. The second year was like four, then eight, then 20, then 40. And you know now we're looking at over $100 million, so around $170 million being carried over on this program. Um, it's it's uh, too easy even a loophole to get into. Uh, and it's a, I mean, compared to the growth of the rest of the program or the population growth, the growth in this do, in this kind of dollar amount and carrying over is what's really driving this wagon. Well, as we said in the beginning, I, I hope <laughs> that these are complicated issues. They're yeah. complicated problems to understand. Um, and there are people like yourself who are analysts who's spent a good part of a career, I guess, trying to keep up on these issues as well as the lawmakers who are on the appropriate committees trying to stay on top of them. But David Vinkler, we appreciate you taking the time and sharing your thoughts with us. And Thanks for having me. As we go forward, maybe we can <laughs> visit again and uh, give people an update. Maybe we'll Let go me, piece by piece. <laughs> uh, what I, actually, I'll throw out one last question. Yeah. Do you think we're going to have a bill before the end of the session ends at the end of May? Do you think we'll have a reform bill come out of the legislature this spring, or do you think it'll be uh, carried over to the next time they come in the fall or the next legislature? Well, I think this year the the reform will be the budget and how they pass this budget. Um, the amount of legislation that's are going to have to go into this to make this legal um, will also be in what's called the budget implementation bill. Um, and this year that bill will probably be monumental. Uh, they do these, I mean, they do that every year, but with all these Medicaid cuts, um, most of those are statutorily required. Uh, that uh, that bill will be enormous, okay. um, and they do have to do it. Well, David Vinkler, again, thank you for joining <laughs> us on the Illinois Channel. Thank you. <laughs> You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation form to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. 